Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Today we're gonna to take a look at a really neat bookshelf speaker. This is the Dolly Opticon 2 Mark II. And they're really remarkable. So sit back, relax, and we're gonna talk about these wonderful little six and a half inch two ways. Old Guy Hi-Fi, we two men. Never lie. Songs from days gone passing by. Echoes from a distant time. Well, before we get started, big shout out to Mike Holm and the team at Holm Audio. They are our high end audio reseller here in the western suburbs of Chicago, located in Woodridge, Illinois. There will be a link to their website in the pinned comment and in the video description. So, what is the Dolly Opticon 2 Mark II? Well, obviously, it's a stand mount speaker. Uh, six and a half inch two way. They run $1,350 for the pair uh, as of the date of this recording, which is in November 3rd of 2024. Um, really well constructed. This is actually made in Denmark. This is not an offshore build. It, I think everything, I think Dolly builds everything in house, um, including the drivers, but I can't confirm that, but it is really well constructed. This is called Tobacco Oak. It's a really pretty speaker. One of the things that Dolly is kind of famous for is their brown woofers. Now this is a wood fiber woofer, and I don't know the exact designation or distinction of what that is. I know with a pulp or paper pulp driver, what it is, it's a slurry of paper and all kinds of other materials with a binding material in it. And it's pressed into shape and then it's heated and baked and then you get a paper cone. I think with the fiber, that kind of indicates that it's longer fibers, maybe kind of like a fiberglass sort of concept and it's mashed and mixed. And that can be very rigid and still very lightweight as you know, fiberglass is. So maybe that's what this is, but it sounds really good. It works very well. So six and a half inch wood fiber woofer, uh, 1.14 inch, 29 millimeter, uh, soft dome tweeter, <coughs> excuse me, crossover is 2000 hertz. They are rated at 86 dB, four ohms, so they're not the easiest thing in the world to drive. And they have a claim frequency response of 59 to 25,000 hertz. And I would say in room, they go, they do better than that. They had a very, very pleasing bass response. Um, and I think one of the things that contributed that contributes to that, excuse me, is Dolly has this patent or this proprietary uh, material called soft magnetic composite that they use to manufacture the pole piece of the speaker and the magnetic ring around it. And it's a powdered material that's sintered into the shape that they want. Goodness, um, sintered into the shape that they want and then pressed in and made into the woofer cone. So you get a very lightweight, but remember a speaker is nothing but a pistonic electric motor. It's got a coil of wire around the voice coil and you apply current to that and it's in a, in a magnetic gap and it moves back and forth. So this SMC material is designed to optimize that pistonic motion, reduce distortion, reduce hysteres, which are eddy currents and things like that, that can affect how the cone either returns or moves based on the incoming signal applied to the voice call. So it's, I'm sorry to get a bit technical, but it makes for a very low distortion uh, woofer. And that's really, really important because some woofers can exhibit third order distortions, which are very audible and it kind of just muddies the sound up. It's not like you hear it per se, but it adds to the noise floor, which is a big deal for me. And it just kind of takes some of the life out of it and detail out of it and kind of macro detail out of it. These did an exceptionally good job of that. Twitter's very sweet sounding, um, just a really, really nice speaker. So how did I test it? Primarily I tested it. So just to, for you know your guys' edification, I try to test things, you know, especially speakers or DACs, on products I know the sound of really, really well. So what's my reference stuff? Well, primarily it's the Cambridge Evo 150. Um, you know, I, that's my piece. I know what it is at $3,000. It's a super high resolution, super accurate, very detailed, amazingly uh, good sounding, great imaging amplifier. Uh, it is class D, it's a Hypex Encore. So I know the sound of that amp ex exceptionally well. I also used my shit Bifrost, which I know the sound of exceptionally well. And for a time, I did use the live Harmony deck, which I've had here for a while, and I'm getting to understand the sound of that extraordinarily piece, extraordinary piece very well. So that's how I tested it. Everything was streamed from Art of Vinyl, although I did play a, vinyl, a lot of vinyl. And one of the albums I'm going to talk about today, I, I listened to it on vinyl, not streaming, because it sounds better on vinyl to me. So that's how I tested them. And I've been 
listening to him almost exclusively for the last 10 days and very remarkable speaker. So we'll get into it a little bit. But the first recording I used is this recording from Annie Lennox called Nostalgia. And this is Annie interpreting the great American songbook, you know, songs like Sep uh, September on My Mind and Mood Indigo and um, I Cover the Waterfront. Her voice and this, the, first of all, this is an absolutely impeccable studio album. This is remarkably well recorded. Just beautiful job on the engineering and everything else. All of the players in the on the recording were at the top of their game. Impeccable, impeccable. And her voice is absolutely phenomenal. It's almost a bit like she's crooning. She's working the notes. She's bending the lyrics. She has that immense talent. She's got such texture and such a voice of experience, not world weariness, but just a voice of experience. Um, and she's taking these classic songs and she's making them her own. She does a virgin, a version, a virgin, a version of Georgia on my mind. Now I'm a big fan of that. Uh, to me, the, the two best recordings, and I'm not going to include this one quite yet. Ray Charles did a version that's just absolutely amazing. And Jerry Reed did a version of Georgia on my mind. That's absolutely amazing. Her version of Georgia on my mind is the absolute best version I have ever heard. I absolutely was sitting there and it brought tears to my eyes. It was so beautiful. I'm getting emotional thinking about it right now. Her voice, her texture, her what the feeling and the energy she puts into that. It's breathtaking. I was covered with goosebumps for the entire length of the song. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal performance. And these did an excellent job of obviously bringing that to me and engaging me not only, you know, just from a performance standpoint, but emotionally and physically. Just wonderful job. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. High marks for this recording. If you're not, if you've not heard Annie Lennox, you gotta listen to this album. It's just phenomenal. And there'll be a link for it, like all the other albums in the video description. Next, I spun some vinyl on this, and it's also available digitally. Uh, Les McCann and Eddie Harris, this is the Swiss movement. I've used this before. I love this because I think it is one of the finest live jazz recordings ever made. There is so much detail and so much nuance in this. Whoever engineered this and set it up on stage did an amazing job. There is a lot. I was hearing some detail out of these that I'd only heard on much more expensive speakers. There are points in between the songs or just as they're getting ready to start a song or announce a song where you can hear someone grab the microphone and move it to the position they want. You can hear people stirring on the stage. Um, the detail retrieval that this speaker gave to me, again, rivaled far more expensive speakers. Really wonderful. Um, and this album just, it, for a jazz album, it rocks. It gets going. The first song they do is compared to what it's a Les McCann protest song. It's amazing. His voice is very, very textured and very kind of gravelly and there's good energy in it. And, you know, he's a, a very experienced jazz, jazz man and, you know, funk and blues guy. Just wonderful. And then they do a song called Cold Duck Time. And the amazing thing about this is they had never seen the music until they got on stage to perform it. And they rock it. It's unbelievable. Everybody's at the top of their game. You can hear the ride cymbal just as delicate as can be. You can hear rim shots, the bass drum, the big acoustic bass, double bass, the saxophone. Eddie Harris's trumpet just bites you, but comes through with tremendous strength. And when Les McCann does his solo, he is banging away on that piano for all it's worth. And you can hear him under his breath, the mic's picking it up, him kind of scatting to the music. He's not doing it on purpose, not part of the performance. It's just that's he was so into and so involved in his in his playing of that. He got his whole body was involved and you could hear him scatting. What a wonderful recording. Just an amazing recording. It was done in 1969 at the Montreux uh, Jazz Festival. Just phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. It's just amazing. So highly recommended that one. Swiss movement. Now, to do some classical music and to get some really good imaging sense, because obviously the Annie Lennox is a studio album, the Les McCann, all live music is mono. Um, they did mix it really well for the, for the final release. And on the album, it sounded great. And it had some good imaging, but it was not razor sharp or absolutely perfect. So I used this recording from Lauren Mazel in the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra, Bruckner's Symphony No. 3 in D minor. And this is phenomenal. It is from 2013. And it was recorded in Munich at the Philharmonie Gesteig, I think. And it is an amazing concert hall. It is world famous for its acoustics. And Lauren Mazel and the orchestra, Lauren Mazel is one of my most favorite 
uh, conductors in the world. I had an opportunity to meet the maestro. I was just in the receiving line just to shake hands and so forth. But uh, he has he has perfect recall and perfect pitch. So he'll conduct an entire symphony and he has no sheet music in front of him. He just knows it. He has the ability just to have that. He knows it. It's phenomenal to me. And he is at, this is toward the end of, you know, kind of his career, but he is at the top of his game and the Munich Philharmonic is at the top of their game. And Bruckner's symphony is called the, Vog the Wagner symphony because uh, uh, when Bruckner wrote it, he wrote it, wrote it between 1872 and 1877. And it was kind of a tribute to uh, Wagner and it had a lot of kind of Wagnerian, Wagnerian themes in it. And when it was uh, debuted in 1877, he got so much criticism with it from it that he went back and kind of revised it. And it was revised several times. And I think the version in this recording is the final revision of that. Um, it just, this is an amazing, amazingly well-recorded album. Um, it's a Sony, it's a Sony recording. I don't know if it was a Sony team or if it was someone else, but the recording quality is just absolutely stellar. You get an amazing sense of the space. You get amazing detail from the orchestra. There are quiet passages where maybe it's just a solo clarinet, just taking the theme and working it very, very quietly at a whisper. And you can hear people turn the page on their libretto, or you can hear them stir in their chair. The detail retrieval is just amazing. And again, this is one of those recordings, and I've talked about this before, I think, where you get a sense that there's actually people there making the music. It's not just this music. It's not just notes. There's a human involvement. There's there's life part is part of that recording and that, per, and that performance. And this can go from an absolute, just the quietest whisper to the most extraordinary crescendos. This is a very, very engaging symphony. If you're not familiar with Bruckner, this is a good one to start with. It's just remarkable. And the recording, again, is amazing. Mazel's, you know, guide, uh, his uh, directorship or conductorship of the orchestra is absolutely amazing. It is perfectly timed. It is absolutely perfectly paced. And that's the conductor dictates the pace for the orchestra. Just amazing. And you get the big kettle drums and you get the quiet stuff. And there are passages in the first in the first movement at about the 10 minute mark. You can hear people stirring and, you know, people flipping the page on the music stand. But at about 12 minutes into the first movement, there are you can hear all of the big double basses being bowed. You can hear. I don't know if it's a French horns or trombones or tubas, but they're the, the brass is this deep brass sound, just wonderful sound. And these plaintive clarinets and obviously the violins and strings, you can pull out individual instruments. So that's a good lead into imaging for this imaging on these speakers. Obviously, it's it, it is system dependent, but having known how the Evo images and were listening to other speakers, these threw down an amazing image, very wide, very tall, great depth on it, very good image placement, good laser sharp center image, and very good, not hyper detailed, but very, very good sense of, all right, we know where everybody in the orchestra is sitting. We can, I can picture that fan shape seating uh, chart in my mind. Um, and it's all there and it's all accurate. And if I close your, if you close your eyes and you really focus, you can, all right, that's where the oboe is. That's where, all right, first cello is there. That kind of, it does give you that, um, but it's not hyper detailed. So let's talk about the sound quality. So excellent imaging. Um, uh, you know, I have the ELAC DBR62s, which is an absolutely phenomenal imaging speaker at its price point. But they're around half the price of these. These do a better job. They have a much tighter cabinet than the ELACs. Obviously, made in Denmark, not offshore. So these are a far better speaker. I, I will make another comparison a little bit later on. But from a from a sonic standpoint, again, they don't dig super deep. And I never played them with the subwoofer. Um, but they get down low enough that those double bases, those big bowed double bases, all of that you know, it's really probably right in that 80 to 200 hertz range with the brass and with the, the, the kettle drums and everything like that. Reproduced really well, very agile, very, sorry, very fast, um, really, really well done. You've got a really good pace, really good detail, really good detail. I mean, you, I could sense the body. I could sense the bow on the strings and the body of the basses as they were being bowed. And then, of course, when you get into another part of the symphony where everybody, all the woodwinds, or excuse me, all the string instruments are plucking, the speed and the attack and the pluck was just sh sharp and the micro details were excellent. These really did an excellent job. And this is an absolutely 
truly outstanding recording. Um, so I tried to give them the best and they did amazing. Good bass, good mid bass, excellent texture. Annie Lennox's voice through the mid range, just she could rise and fall and you could hear it all. And it never, one of the things that this never did, and sometimes it happens with a smaller driver bookshelf speaker is compression. As they crescendos or large transients occur, they can sound compressed. It can get flat sounding. The image kind of collapses when it happens. That never happened with these. They never sounded compressed. The image never collapsed. The detail was always there and it was always apparent. And you could pick out, if you wanted to focus on one thing, you could pull that detail out. Doesn't matter what else was going on. So absolutely stellar through the mid-range with vocals, with all the mid-range. Piano, Les McCann's piano sounded amazing. I mean, he was banging on, and, and a lot of times the piano, as you go up the right hand on the piano, it can start sounding very glary, almost like a bell ringing kind of sound. None of that apparent on this. Now, way up on the super top end, yeah, there might be a little, I don't want to say soft, maybe politeness, a little kindness. I don't think it rounds the edges. It just doesn't ex exacerbate the edges. This is not a hyper detailed speaker. This is not a Focal. This is not a B&W. This is very much its own sound and Dolly has a house sound. This is just delicate, but man, it could slap you in the face when there's a, a, a transient. Absolutely beautiful. Decays were wonderful. And again, all the inner detail and microdynamics were very, very well reproduced. Of course, they were getting a really good signal and that's important. Great recording, great amplifier, and they delivered. Man, did they deliver. One of the best, especially at this price point, sounding uh, stand mount speakers I've ever heard. Now, I had done the monitor audio, first generation monitor audio Silver 100s, and they have an eight inch woofer, so they do dig deeper, but they also have a metal dome tweeter, so they're, they can get a little exciting at the top end. This rivaled them on, almost got, almost got to the monitor audio on imaging, not quite there, but just a delicacy and a sweetness and a listenability that I wish the monitor audio had with that imaging that they do. So this is a great speaker. At $1,350, it's remarkable, it's really, really good. Um, I've not heard another bookshelf speaker in this price category, and I've listened to a few. Um, not all of them have been recording. This kind of before I start the channel, started the channel. This is a very, very good speaker. I highly recommend it. Um, if you're looking for, uh, you know, something that can, it can rock out, it can, but it can handle the classics and the vocals and just the classical music so well, just really did an excellent job. Dolly, Opticon 2, Mark 2, again, big shout out to Mike Holman, Home Audio for loaning them to me. I think I've covered all of the stuff I need to cover. Highly recommended, highly recommended. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the video and hopefully you would give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel, there's a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. There are also a membership link in the pinned comment and in the video description. There will be a link to Home Audio's website in the pinned comment and in the video description. Again, I have no affiliation with them other than Mike is generous enough to loan me gear. Um, there are affiliate links in the video description. There's my playlist. Please visit the community post for some great playlists. Please comment. Let me know what you think. Are, what, what are you looking for? Are you in the market for a stand mount speaker you know what kind of sound do you like um what do you how do you guys feel about the music i recommend i'd love to hear that um obviously i have some playlists there under you know construction a little bit but let me know your thoughts about all of that stuff i think that's everything please like subscribe comment if you want you can follow me on instagram my name's ed homewood this is the old guy hi-fi channel and now it's your obligation your duty to yourself to maybe pour yourself a nice glass of wine on a Sunday afternoon, sit back and listen to some really, really beautiful music that hopefully, hopefully engages you emotionally, maybe on a really cool set of stand mount uh, speakers. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Feel the rhythms break through.